Hi, this is Dr. Claire, and this is our lecture on plant reproduction. And in particular, in this lecture, we are going to be focusing on reproduction in angiosperms. So angiosperms are the flowering plant, um, and the reproductive structure in the angiosperm is the flower. So when somebody gives you a bouquet of flowers, they're basically giving you a lovely bouquet of plant genitalia. So just remember that next time you give someone a hard time for not buying you flowers. All right. Um, and flowers, of course, come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes, um, but they're all doing the same basic function, which is that they're producing the, the um, male and female uh, gametophytes, which we talked about in the alternation of generations lecture. And then those gametophytes are going to produce the sperm and eggs, which then will, will fuse to, uh, to form a new plant. Okay? Um, so let's start by looking at the structure of a flower. Um, now, in the, ang in the uh, angiosperms, or the flowering plants, the flower does house the gametophyte generation, um, and the flowers, flowers all have a, a similar general structure. And you can divide the flower into what we call different whorls. So these whorls are basically like circles of similar structures that are contained within each other. Okay? So the outermost whorl of the flower is what's called the sepals. The sepals are those little leaf-like structures, like if you have a rosebud, you'll notice that there are some little leaf-like structures that are kind of encasing the bud. And those are the sepals. Okay, So that's the outermost whorl. The next whorl is the petals. Um, the petals are usually very colorful and showy. They are often important for attracting pollinators to the flower, and those are often what we consider the pretty part of the flower. Is the those petals. Okay? Then the third whorl is where the um, male gametophytes are formed. So that's those are called the stamens. Um, they are a long filament with an anther at the end. The anther is where the pollen is produced. Um, and that pollen grain, remember, is that male gametophyte. So then the, the pollen is going to leave the anther and hopefully go somewhere where it can find a female gametophyte. So that's in the, in the third whorl. And then the innermost whorl, the central whorl, is where the female gametophyte is housed. Um, that's called the carpal. Um, there can be one or more carpals. The carpal has three different parts. The base of the carpal is the ovary. Um, that is where the ovules are, where the megaspore will form, the female gametophyte will form, is within the ovary. Um, and then that ovary uh, in an angiosperm will actually grow to become the fruit of the plant afterwards. So the, the, the fruit is part of the uh, sporophyte generation, but it contains the megaspore, which then becomes pollinated and becomes, the megaspore is the gametophyte generation that is pollinated by the pollen. All right. So on top of the ovary, you have the, uh, the style, which is a long extension that goes up to connect to the stigma, which has a sticky surface, and that's where the pollen grains will actually land. So the pollen grains will land on that stigma, the pollen tube will grow down the style to the ovary to pollinate the, the, um, the megaspores within the ovary, and that's where the seed is going to form. All right. So a flower that has all four different whorls, that has sepals and petals and stamens and carpels, is called a complete flower. Not all flowers are complete. Okay. Um, some flowers are missing parts. Um, so a lot of flowers are what we call perfect flowers, meaning that they are bisexual. They produce both male and female gametes. So the flowers on the top here have both a carpel and stamens. Um, but not all flowers are that way. So some flowers are actually unisexual, so they're either missing the carpels or they're missing the stamens, um, and those are what we call imperfect flowers. And if you're looking at plants that have imperfect flowers, sometimes a single plant will have both male and female flowers on the same plant. So this little red flower here has males. This is a male there, and this one's a female. Male and female flowers on the same plant. That's something that we call a monoecious plant. Monoecious means one house. So males and females are found in the same house or they're on the same plant. Um, other plants are dioecious um, and those ones, uh, the whole plant will either produce male flowers or it'll produce female flower, flowers and they're not present on the same plant. Um, dioecious means two houses. Okay, So the, the males and females are in two separate houses. All right. Um, so in this case you have male and female flowers but they are not found on the same plant. Okay. <clears throat> so most flowers in the world are perfect. They do have both male and female parts. Um, but, uh, and most flowers could fertilize themselves. But why would you not want to fertilize yourself? You know, hopefully you're thinking about inbreeding. Inbreeding is a very bad thing, generally. Let's say you have a, 
a recessive allele that's very bad um, and you breed with yourself, then you have a very high chance of having uh, offspring that have two of those recessive bad alleles. And if you have two recessive bad alleles, then you actually have the trait. Whereas if you're a heterozygote and you only have one, it doesn't show up, right? So um, inbreeding is generally not a good thing. So how do plants avoid breeding with themselves? Well, there's a couple things they can do. So one thing they can do is that they can uh, spatially separate where the pollen is produced and where the stigma are. So this is uh, the center of a hibiscus flower. At the base of the flower here are where the pollen granules are formed, and at the tip of the flower here is where the stigma are. Now, these plants are generally uh, um, for, uh, pollinated by a type of insect that will land at the tip of the stig of the of, of the carpel, and they'll walk down to the base of the flower, and uh, then when they finish feeding at the base of the flower, they'll just fly straight off, so they don't go walk back out to the outside. And so that what that ensures is that the first thing that the insect gets to is a place where it can drop off pollen, so it can drop off pollen from another flower, and then it walks through the pollen, so it picks up new pollen from this flower, and then it doesn't walk back out to drop it off on the same flower. So it flies off and it drops it off somewhere else. So you can spatially separate your anthers and your stigmas. Um, the other thing you could do is have them, the anther and the stigma mature at different times. So you temporally separate the anther and the stigma. This is a magnolia blossom. Um, the first thing that happens in a magnolia blossom is that the stigmas become receptive to pollen. So they mature first. Um, and the anthers are immature and aren't producing pollen. So now if a, if a pollinator comes in, it, there's no pollen to pick up. So it's not going to accidentally transfer that to that same flower. Then later, after the stigma have a chance to be pollinated, then the anthers start to produce their pollen. And so then when a pollinator comes in, it, it doesn't matter if it drops off pollen or not because those, those stigmas have already <clears throat> received their pollen and it can pick up new pollen and then fly off to another flower. All right, so another thing that a plant could do to avoid pollinating itself is to have some sort of genetic incompatibility where it doesn't allow incompatible pollens to uh, germinate. And so in this case, the tissue of the, of the stigma and the style will actually block the growing of pollen that is genetically similar, okay? So um, in this case, uh, we, if we have a plant that has the genotype S1, S2, and that's its genotype, that's the plant's genotype, um, that plant can produce pollen that is of S1, and it can produce pollen that is of S2, because remember the pollen is haploid, the plant is diploid. So uh, if either S1 or S2 lands on that plant, the plant will actually block the pollen tubes from growing, so that pollen cannot fertilize the plant. Um, if you have an S1, S3 plant, and S1 and S2 land on the plant, only the S2 pollen will be allowed to grow, um, because uh, the S1 will be blocked, because it's the same allele that the plant has. S2 is a different allele, so it can actually go in and, and pollinate the flower. And then if you have a plant that's completely different, that has two different alleles, and you get the S1, S2 pollen landing on there, then either of those can fertilize it. So basically it just blocks pollen that has the same allele as it does, okay? All right, so those are some ways that plants can avoid mating with themselves. All right, so they don't want to mate with themselves, they do want to mate with someone else. So how do you get your pollen from you that were from the anther to some other flower somewhere. Um, there's two way, main ways that plants do this. They use, a lot of them use wind, and a lot of them use animals of various types to move the pollen. Um, so wind pollinated flowers tend to look uh, fairly sim similar. <clears throat> They're very simple. Um, so these are some examples of wind pollinated flowers. You notice that there's no showy leaves. They're not brightly colored. They're not producing a bunch of nectar. There's no reason for that. They just produce lots and lots and lots of pollen. And then when the wind comes by, it shakes these little flowers and the pollen releases and it floats up into the air and floats around in the air until it lands on a, fl a female flower of the right type. These are the types of flowers that people tend to be allergic to because they produce a lot of pollen. And then when you breathe, that pollen goes up your nose and then your immune system decides that it's an invader and then you get a really snotty nose and itchy eyes and it's not very much fun. Um, so the, th the things that people tend to be allergic to are things like grasses and trees that are wind pollinated. All right. 
Um, most of the pretty flowers are things that are pollinated by animals. Um, and so some of the animals uh, that pollinate things you're probably familiar with, with like bees. Um, bee pollinated flowers tend to be relatively large. A lot of times they have these little dots. Those indicate to the bee that there's a tasty reward in there. Um, some flowers are bird pollinated. Bird pollinated flowers tend to have very long skinny blossoms that a bird's beak can slip into. And flowers are also pollinated by butterflies. Um, and, and some, you know, so, so some of the butterflies, they tend to be very small flowers because the butterfly's got this little teeny proboscis that it just goes around and drinks. So each flower is, is um, co-evolved with the pollinator that it works with. So um, these pollinators are getting a benefit from the flower. The flower is providing a tasty sugar meal to the pollinator, and the pollinator is moving the, the flower's pollen around. So both benefit. Um, this last one here, this one I think is kind of fun. This is a fly pollinated flower. It smells like rotting meat. So it actually kind of fools the fly into coming down to see if there's somewhere there that the fly can lay its egg on because the fly is looking for rotting meat to lay its eggs on. Um, so some of them are a little bit trickier and do things like that. Okay, so you get your pollen over there, and so the pollen hopefully fertilizes the, the, uh, the egg, and then um, you have your seeds. Um, now, seeds are a really important adaptation to living on land because um, the seed is basically uh, the, em the embryonic plant that is in a, a state of, um, of uh, dormancy. So it's a it can just kind of stop and not grow and be protected until conditions are right for that seed to germinate. So there's enough water, it's warm enough, and all that stuff. Then once the seed germinates, remember you have that triploid endosperm that formed from the double fertilization uh, of the egg. Um, go back to your alternation of generations of lecture if you don't remember what I'm talking about there. Um, and that triploid endosperm is going to provide the food for the embryo when it starts to grow. Um, so plants are photosynthetic. They can make their own food, but when seeds first germinate, they don't have any leaves yet. So they have to have enough food to get to the point where they have leaves. Um, the seed is also surrounded by an uh, impermeable seed coat that um, protects the embryo and uh, allows it to just survive until the conditions are right. All right, so you've got all these seeds. Now, um, <clears throat> they're really important because they do protect the young plant when it's most vulnerable. They allow plants to survive these harsh periods, like the winter, for example. So a lot of little um, soft plants, they can't survive cold conditions. They freeze. And so they'll bloom during the summer, produce seeds that can then fall to the ground and remain dormant on the ground all the way through the winter and then germinate in the spring. Okay. Um, Everything that the, the, the plant needs to germinate is contained there within the seed. And some seeds actually help to facilitate the dispersal of the embryo as well. Um, so let's take a little bit a little bit of a closer look about how you might get your seed from one place to another. Um, within the angiosperms, the seeds are contained within the ovary of the flower. And that ovary will quite often develop into a fruit. Um, so that's the definition, the biological definition of a fruit is it is a it's the developed uh, ovary of the plant. So anything that has seeds in it that's a plant, anything that has seeds in it that's a plant is a fruit, including cucumbers, pumpkins, um, tomatoes, um, you know, obvious fruits like apples, uh, anything like that, all of those are fruits. So vegetable does not have a biological definition. So things, many things that we call vegetables are actually fruits, okay? Um, so that fruit, that ovary develops, a lot of times it becomes full of sugar. Why would you want to fill a fruit full of sugar? Well, it makes it a tasty treat for something, right? So that's going to help if there's an animal that wants to eat that sweet fruit. That's going to help move the seed away from the parent, which is a good thing. So the fruits are really important for dispersal. So some fruits are sweet, like these berries here. A bird might eat that berry and then poop out the seed somewhere else. Um, other fruits allow for dispersal in other ways, like burrs, for example. If you have a dog who gets into some burrs and they get all those burrs in their furs, as I say to my dog, Rio, you have burrs in your furs, and I have to pull them all out. My dog is a very good seed disperser. That's actually the fruit that's forming that kind of grippy, pokey outer thing that allows the, the seed to get away from the parent plant. Um, other fruits can allow the seed to fly, like dandelion fruits that um, attach to the seed and can be caught by the wind to disperse the seed by the wind. And coconut husks are actually the fruit of the coconut and they float so they can float that seed to a new location. All right, 
So that's it for plant reproduction, and I'll catch you next time.